All good. <sighs> anyway, good morning. Thank you for good being morning. here. Well, good afternoon. Yeah. It's afternoon here and it's afternoon where you are for sure. It is. It is. It is 2 p.m. in the great wide north of Minnesota. So. Hi, Leona. Uh, hi, Leona. Hi, Melanie. Hi, Amir. Hello, everyone who's hopping on. Thank you for being here. So um, I was saying while you were getting your phone that I'm still a little bit sick and I'm like day quilled up. So I feel a little like I feel oh. fine, but my body keeps trying to cough up my lungs. Um, oh. It's really gross. <laughs> it's really gross. <laughs> That's um, like a normal occurrence for me. So I feel your pain and oh my goodness. Yuck. Oh man. And like, yeah, I don't know. It's just a weird cold where I started feeling last Saturday. So it's been a week now. I started feeling like a little bit of a sore throat and I was like, I'm not going to get sick. I'm not going to get sick. I'm not going to get sick. And then it progressed into a cough. And then I had two days of feeling like death and now I feel fine, but the cough is definitely still happening. Yeah. So anyway, that's enough about my bronchial issues. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what I was trying to explain to everyone is if I seem extra loopy, I'm blaming Dayquil. <laughs> so, I mean, you can blame me. It's I always I always joke that everything is my fault, so it's fine. Well, like, <laughs> I like that. nothing is your fault. Um, <laughs> so let's start with just the beginning. So tell everybody your name and a little bit about you, where you live, what you do. Sure. Um, so I'm Shannon Townsend. Hi. Uh, I am a belly dancer and teacher and a theatric coach for dancers. Uh, I am also, I spent many years working as an artist, so I have a graphic arts background. Um, I'm one of those weird super creatives that also has a muggle job because, you know, I like uh, being able to pay my, my stuff on time. Uh, <laughs> I've done a lot of freelance work over the years and I just like, it was a choice and I, it, it was just something I decided to do. Um, and my day job, currently I'm an education assistant and coordinator. Uh, I actually work for the state. I can't get too specific about my role, but a lot of my work has to do right now with uh, race equity and um intercultural development and lots of really heavy stuff so it's it's good stuff but it's um it can get a little heavy at times but yeah <laughs> absolutely awesome so I'm just gonna jump in and say with number one um I want to know why you decided to sign up for Body Love Lab and what some of the issues were that were going on for you when you decided to sign up sure so um, when I decided to sign up, it's really funny because I had, I, as you know, I had, um, signed up and done rocket launcher with you, uh, which I feel like was that first domino that just tipped like almost two years now of just constant change and development in the best way possible. Yeah, girl, you, you, you rocked my world and you're still rocking my world. Um, I had just come off rocket launcher. And I had been through this whole resurgence where I spent, you know, like two, three months in that cohort just working through my creative process and branding myself and trying to figure all this stuff out. And I was like, when I got done with it, I realized like, hey, I'm solid with all these marketing things. I'm really good at marketing myself. I'm really good at coming up with all that stuff. The only disconnect I had was with me. Mm. And that's that's scary, right? So it made me really think about it. I've had a, uh, and I'll delve into this a little bit later, I'm sure, but like I've had a lifelong uh, tumultuous relationship with my body. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a belly dancer. I'm a size 22 and like, I'm a big girl. Um, and at that point, I kind of had this, this big drive to just like get stuff done. I wanted to get stuff done. I wanted to take my troop to the next level. I wanted to really work on stuff. I wanted to travel and perform and do all these amazing things. And I realized I was really great at helping other people do that. I was really bad at helping myself do that. I'm still learning how to help myself do that. Um, but in a different way now with a different focus and a very different um, perspective, that's much more positive. Um, 
but yeah, I was just kind of in this, in this funk where I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I wasn't sure how to go about it. I didn't know. Like, I felt like I was the secondary player in my own story. Uh, <laughs> right. Um, every bit of focus. I, I spent every bit of time preaching body love to my troop and helping them and my students and nurturing a lot of them. And like, that's still really important to me. And I'm known for being a pretty loud and proud body advocate. Like I have been for years. I was a, a speaker at the body love conference in Tucson, Arizona. I've uh, given presentations. I've done like self love workshops with other dancers and movement artists and I, like, I think at that point, I was also feeling some imposter syndrome, right? Mm -hmm. Which I hate. I hate imposter syndrome. I hate it so much. Um, I was just kind of in a, I don't want to say I was in like a really dark and like depressive place, but it was definitely like being smacked upside the head with this realization that like, girl, you spend so much time trying to help others find body love and trying to like elevate other people I was so lost with myself and I'm like wow that's a huge disconnect on a physical level on an emotional level and like everybody else I struggle with body image tremendously because even though I've been doing this like god since like 2004 this dance form I get passed up for a lot of stuff regardless of my skill and a lot of times it's because of my body and that was really really hard for me and I think I was really struggling with how to get through that and like all those things just kind of lumped together I was like all right it's time to get off my butt <laughs> and join the program and do the thing so you just said so many things that are so powerful so I just want to like touch on a few of them uh, so I'm going to go backwards. So first of all, for the people who uh, caught the beginning where she was talking about doing rocket launcher uh, Shannon is like um, I'm just so lucky and grateful to have you in my life, but she's one of those people who has been in literally every group coaching program I've done now. Um, so she was in my very first one, which was Rocket Launcher, um, which was really focused on on business for artists and helping artists, hi Cindy, helping artists and especially dancers um, with the business side of their work, with branding, with marketing, with identifying who you are and like really solidifying your business plans. Um, and if you know me, um, the, the journey that I've been on over the past couple of years with my business is that that's where I thought my business was going to go. I did not know that I was going to be working in the body love arena. I didn't know that this was going to be like the thing that was going to kind of take over my work. Um, so where I was with Rocket Launcher was really where I started my business, which was I thought I was going to help artists with the business side of their work. And what happened, which I mean, makes sense because of how I am as a person uh, is that it just, I ended up going straight into like, but what's going on with you? Because as artists, what's going on with us is what's going on with our art. And what's going on with us is what's going on with our business. And so I'm like, like, you can skip all the other shit. Like I can, we can solve all the creativity problems and all the business problems when we solve the us problems, right? Yes. So, right. So like what you said was so powerful that like, okay, I'm really good at all this business stuff, but I'm still emotionally struggling. Right. Um, and I think a lot of people stay there forever. Right. Like yeah. I get everything on the outside working well enough that no one knows I'm struggling. And then I live there in my, in my yeah. quiet struggle forever. Um, another thing that you said that I think was really powerful was that you are First of all, like you are a body advocate professionally, right? Like in yeah. dealing with race advocacy, let's be very clear. That is a body advocacy issue. When we're talking about race issues, we're talking about things that happen to bodies, right? Injustices, systemic injustice is something that happens yeah. to bodies. It happens to people's bodies, right? These are not big intellectual concepts that exist elsewhere. These are bodies in cells, yeah. right? <laughs> On this is real shit. So, and then speaking at body love conferences, working with other dancers about it, you are already intellectually, politically, socially, professionally enmeshed in this world, but emotionally still struggling. And so I guess the question that comes up for me then is 
that difference between intellectually understanding something and emotionally feeling it, right? Being able to intellectually understand that all bodies are inherently equal of love, dignity, respect, care, and happiness, but then not being able to feel for yourself that you personally are worthy of love, dignity, respect, care, and happiness. Yeah. Um, and so I guess, and, and I didn't know I was going to ask this question, but this is like kind of where we're going. Um, oh, this does kind of work with the question. So in Body Love Lab, was there a point where you started to feel a shift for yourself where you were no longer just intellectually working through the issues, but you were personally and emotionally shifting something for yourself? Yes. Um, and I can tell you the exact <laughs> moment it happened. Like it was, it was like, I hesitate. I always laugh. Oh, you poor thing. Um, I always laugh when I talk about it because it makes so much sense now. And I joke all the time about with my students, like light bulb moments where it's just like, ping. Oh, I get it. Duh. Um, <laughs> and, um, it was when we, we were having one of our calls and, or one of our like weekly video streams in the program and you made a comment everybody always makes this correlation with oh you should treat your body the way that like a mother would treat their child and I have a really hard time with that connection because I have a terrible relationship with my mother I'm estranged from her so like people say maternal and I instantaneously shut off like, like in my brain, I'm like, nope, that's Triggerville. I'm not going there. But you made a comment at one point <laughs> where you said, you should treat your bodies the way that we treat a beloved pet. And it made me think about that. I say I have four adopted cats and I've been doing um, rescue work pretty much my whole life. And it made me realize I'm always so hard on myself but like when it comes to my cats if something hurts i take them to the doctor immediately if something with them is suffering i address it immediately we don't wait they get the best possible food they get the best possible water fresh all the time i have this thing with all of them where it's like i don't care if i'm running five minutes late in the morning if they want my attention for five minutes and they want my love i will give them my attention for that extra five minutes because like, I have a whole world out there. They don't, We're, I'm like their whole world. So I, I don't hesitate to stop and snuggle them and give them a hug. And I was like, oh my God, I don't do that for me. Shannon, you don't do that for yourself. You, you said that on one of the calls and it was like, bing, oh my God. I'm an idiot sometimes. I'm not giving myself that five minutes. And like, we think of self care as, like a very linear thing. Like self-care is not just, hey, I'm running a bath and I'm putting on some Michael Buble. Like, you know, it's, don't get me wrong, it's great. But like sometimes self-care is like taking that extra five minutes to really do something for yourself. Like give yourself the best food and give yourself a hug and remind yourself that you're worth it and mm -hmm. treat yourself the same way that you would treat your, your pet or your child. Like even though that's, like it's a different correlation with me just because of my personal experiences. That was really the moment that it transformed. Amazing. So there's a couple of things in there I want to touch on. One is that the, the other importance with that, and we do talk about the body as a, a pet a lot mm -hmm. is that for those other, those of you who are pet parents, I'm also a pet parent. Um, I'm not a, a, a human parent. Um, but <laughs> the other great thing about relating to your body as a pet is that our pets communicate with us non-verbally and we are finely attuned to what their bodies are telling us, right? So, I mean, I joke all the time that my entire life revolves around what goes into and out of my dog, right? Like, I'm always like, what are you eating? And then I'm like, <laughs> in his poop, right? Like, or you're like, well, are you throwing up, right? Like these are the, and it's, it's funny, but it's true because our indications of how our pets are doing are completely revolved around their nonverbal communication, which is also how our bodies are communicating with us, right? My dog can't tell me he's in pain, but if he's shivering or hunched, I know he's in pain. Um, 
there are certain ways that he moves that I'm, I'm like, you've never walked like that before. I am tuned in to his body because that's how he communicates with me. We are really programmed to dismiss our body's information from the time we're children. And one of the things that we really do in Body Love Lab is first identify that and then start to unpack it because we live in this very um, head dominant my mind is supposed to control my body and my body is this inconvenient thing that is not to be trusted or listened to kind of society. Right. So right. starting from the time you're little where like you're hungry at 11 o'clock, but it's not lunchtime. You're antsy and you want to play, but it's not recess time. You're sleepy and you want to nap, but it's not nap time. Like we are trained. Part of being socialized to being a person is to ignore what your body is telling you about your needs. And that creates distrust, right? That sows the seeds of a relationship in which your body expects you not to be attuned to and care for your own needs. Right. Um, and a, a top-down relationship where you're looking at your body as this, like, um, this really inconvenient thing that's constantly trying to distract you from what you're supposed to be doing. So when we start coming into this this new relationship of, like, oh, when my body is nauseous, hungry, sleepy, cold, sad, a like all of these things that are happening, that is my pet trying to get my attention of, hey, I need something. The exact same way that when my dog is shivering in the corner, I drop everything and I'm like, what's wrong? What's going, yeah. like, I need to like scour the environment. Did you eat something? What happened? How can I take care of you, right? Our body is constantly giving us nonverbal information about our well-being that we usually try to ignore. Uh, so coming into a place where you are finally attuned, as finely attuned to your own physical signals as you would be to that of any other mammal in your care, because that's what your fucking body is, people. It's a mammal in your care. <laughs> you're a mammal. It's like your own little, like from birth till death, here's a mammal. Don't kill it. <laughs> Keep it alive <laughs> as long as possible. That's the game. <laughs> Keep this Tamagotchi working as long as possible. Um, <laughs> oh, man, it pooped again. Now I got to clean it. <laughs> right. I mean, that's a, it's a real thing. The other thing that you mentioned that I think is important is, is the mother issue. Were, were you one of the cohorts? I think the one where I like lost my shit when we started talking about moms. Were you in the one where I was like sobbing, talking about how we have to forgive our moms? Yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I mean, look, there's no, there's no way around that one. Like for every single person I think who comes in, whether you had a pretty good relationship with your mother or not, there's a big part of this process that is reconciling what you learned about nurturing and care from your maternal example no matter what that was. Right. It's fascinating because I'm reading Women Who Run With the Wolves. I don't know if you guys have read this book, but I'm just going to hold it up. And this book is amazing. I highly recommend it. But she basically breaks down like fairy tales and then she interprets them through like psychology and feminist perspectives in this oh. really cool way. So she'll do like a story at a time. And the story she just did was The Ugly Duckling. And basically the story of the ugly duckling, she really digs into first two, con the exile concept and the mother concept. And she breaks down this idea that like all of us have a mother of some sort and that most of us who feel like exiles had problematic mothers. And so she breaks down like the ambivalent mother, the collapsed mother, um, the strong mother and like these different kinds of mothers and when your mother rejects you, when your mother is really into the cultural ideas of femininity uh, social acceptability, wanting to enforce society's ideals onto you and feeling like you're not living up to them. When your mother is absent, 
when your mother is struggling with her own addictions. The internal mother that we develop, because everyone develops an internal mother, right? Male or female, we all develop an internal mother that is a model of the maternal care we received. We develop an internal mother that is based upon the mother we had. And the mother that we had is a human with her own struggles, which you can understand as an adult, but not as a child. Right. And so the wounds, the trauma that we carry in our bodies into adulthood are the, the unreconciled experience of being a little kid who thinks this is my fault or is trying to fix it and being an adult who understands my mother is a human being with her own problems, right? Into, again, intellectually understanding it isn't the same as emotionally healing it. Right. And those two things like, right. So you can intellectually be like, oh yeah, when I'm in my calm moments, I get that my mom is a person who's dealing with her own shit. And she was when I was a kid. That doesn't change the fact that like inside there is a three-year-old me who doesn't understand why my mom's not a different kind of mom. Right. I, I use the phrase all the time that like, while I understand it, the intention behind something does not negate the impact. Right. Yeah. And that's, yeah, that's something I had to get that, that part of body love was, it was a struggle for me. Um, and I'm really, really glad that I did the work on it because it did kind of bring me to a new area where, um, without like delving into too much, cause like it's my upbringing's ugly in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, it, it helped me really work through some things and realize that, yeah, I did have a lot of that, that um, kind of self shamey disconnect did come from a lot of that upbringing. And it like, logically, it was something I think I knew, but emotionally, I was not ready until that time to really accept it and move through it. And I feel like now I have a lot more balance around that boundary. And it does mean like, I've, I've had to kind of break down and rebuild what my personal self love and worth looks like kind of from the ground up, but I mean, as hard as that was, I'm so grateful I had the program because that, that was really the catalyst for it. And that's what really kind of took that to the next level. And it's, it's changed me exponentially in the way that I perceive myself, the way I think about that relationship with her, even though she's out of my life and will not be back. Um, there's still a lot of baggage there. And that's mm -hmm. like, that's, years and years and years of things to work through. And I feel like more on top of it and comfortable with it now than I've ever been. And I, I mean, I would guess that the reason that is, and, and you can tell me if this is true and I'll just share this with everyone is because part of the process that we go through in the lab, I call it reparenting, but it's really the realization that you can create an internal mother for yourself. That is not the yeah. mother you had. That exactly. is who you are to your pets, right? That is the mother that you needed. Um, so the mother that you had, the mother that was modeled for you, does become the internal mother that we usually have by default. But we don't have to keep that one. We can decide at a certain point to create an internal mother that is maternal and nurturing and has a sense of humor and is there for us that is unconditionally accepting and unwavering and that we can create that for ourselves, regardless of what our actual experience was. So once exactly. we start creating that, it, it does give us the strength then to deal with the real people in our lives in a different way, because now we have an internal support system. We're not looking to this flawed, broken person to give us this thing. Now we're like giving ourselves the thing and it makes us much more able to deal with, with everyone else in our lives, but especially the problematic people in our lives. Yes. Awesome. 100%. So that, I mean, it touched on also like um, a, a pillar that was really uh, a struggle for you. So um, was there a pillar that was a surprise for you or maybe one where when you first read it, you didn't understand how it connected to body love, uh, to body love, but once we were doing the work, it made sense. That's a good question. I, I didn't feel really the only thing that I felt really disconnected with was the maternal aspect. Everything else really 
spoke to me really well. And usually I would be like, mm, let's be a good facilitator and take myself out of my comfort zone here because that's how I brain. Um, but really, like everything in the program, I don't think I felt disconnect and pushback only because a lot of the the exercises that are done, some of them are even things that I do on the regular for myself because of the work that I've been through and the training I've had over the years and what I do for a living. Um, I've been very fortunate to have a lot of opportunities to really work through things. Like I, you know, whereas some people freak out if you ask them to sit down and like work on your, your personal like emotive mission statement, like what does life mean to you and blah, 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 blah. Like I do that three times a year as part of my self care. Um, so to me, I, I don't think there was anything that I really struggled with other than that maternal thing, but that was, that was literally just like 20 years of block just coming up and going like, nope, 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 we're not going there. And I had to, I did have to, I do feel like I had to work a little, a little harder on that part. Um, but I was very, very fortunate in that the people that were a part of the program were very understanding and nobody was, you know, I never, I never felt shamed about that struggle at all and so like anybody who is contemplating doing body love please know there will be no shame or anything like that if that's what's holding you back please for the love of god don't don't sweat it um i felt nothing through, through, yeah like i felt nothing through that struggle other than support and an urgence to think outside of my paradigm, but in a very gentle way. And I, like, that's what I really appreciated. Cause like some of the stuff is pretty, is it can get heavy depending on your attachment to that pillar. Oh yeah. So yeah. I, you just said a couple things that are super important. So one is that everyone comes to this work from deep pain. And so I just want people to know that, like, no one stumbles into body love lab. Like, it's not like a Zumba class where you're just going to like, it's, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> no one is in there who is not coming to that work from a place of like really deep, true vulnerability. Yeah. And because of that, everyone understands from jump that like, that we're all struggling with something. And so there is this immediate camaraderie that happens of like, we're all on this path together. And like she said, it depends on the pillar. So everyone has this moment of like, oh shit, in a different place. Um, there are different pillars where like, you know, and it's like by week, like everyone has their breakdown week or two. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> where it's like, oh, this was the thing for me. Like, this is the area where I am the most struggling, where I've been the most self-withholding, where I've been the most wounded, where, where I have the most resistance. But because everyone's kind of doing it at a different time, the whole group is there and they're like, oh yeah, that was me last week. Totally know what you're going through. It's okay. Like, be there with it, be there for it. It is the safest place to unravel. The lab itself is a, it's a Petri dish. It's a container for us to go in and unpack all of this stuff, reorganize it, discard what we don't need, put back in what we like and, and like reemerge a little different. Um, everyone is also pretty hand selected. Um, and I think that people know from me from the beginning that I am ferociously protective of the space. Um, I don't let anyone hide but I also don't let anyone, like th there's no room for anyone to be judgmental in that. I don't, I think that people just feel from the, from the beginning that like, we're there to do such deep work that the work can't be done if we're judgmental. I don't even let people be judgmental of themselves. Like if someone makes yeah. a comment on a call that is self-judgmental, <laughs> I'll be like, stop, stop, stop. What is that? Like, let's, let, let's unpack that. Like, I'm not even going to let that slide. So there's a, a safety in the group. There is also um, a feeling of being held and supported by community, by cohort that I think that, 
one-on-one -on -one healing is really powerful, but group healing is incredibly powerful in, in these kinds of issues because we start to realize that like, you'll have people in other countries, people in other time zones, people of different ethnic backgrounds, people with a completely different life, people with kids, people who are really young, like all over the map. And when yeah. you see that we're all struggling in these same ways, to me, what that opens up is like, oh, it's not me. I'm not crazy. This is a, a, a symptom of a sick system that we're all in. And as a group, we're trying to like unpack what the damage of that system is in our bodies and choose to disengage from it so that we can come back out into our community in a different, more whole, more healthy way so that we can yes. be better people, better friends, better employees, better dancers, better art. Like, right. Like we are opting out. We're opting out as a group. Right. And so like that, it's really deep work to, to disentangle ourselves and to recognize that like, we are not fundamentally flawed. We are, we are responding exactly the way we're supposed to, to a system that's designed to disempower us. Yes. Yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> if it, you, you come out of it with this much broader perspective of like how really, really huge the systemic problem around body image and the way that we perceive people even it like it even changed the way I advocate for um my disabled friends like as a show producer it's completely made me way more aware of like where I have failed people even in the best of intentions and I hate I don't like using the word fail like I think I think fail is a bad choice of word but it's made me realize where I can improve and it's it really turned me even into an advocate where I can go, okay, this is where I am fortunate enough to like be able to offer opportunities to maybe performers that are disabled. How can I change that? How can I do better work? And through my work, like help elevate others in a way that like, I'm not coaching, but I am trying to facilitate those discussions and having conversations with local theaters and going, Hey, like, do you have accessible green rooms? Do you have blah, 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 blah. And it like, these are things I literally didn't really think about. It was just like, I'm kind of ashamed to admit that. Um, but like there, it made me very aware of a lot of those things. And now it's, you know, become a primary driver of what I do with my shows and like, what opportunities can I afford people? Am I giving those opportunities to, you know, non-binary performers and trans performers. And, you know, I have a, I have a local burlesker that I'm really hoping I can get for the next show. Cause like, she's in a wheelchair and she's amazing and has EDS. Mm -hmm. And like, it just makes me so much more aware of the value and the beauty in different people's bodies and the strength that they're capable of. And like, I, I was unable to really open that door until I got through the stuff with me. Mm. And this program was the catalyst for that. Like it changed my whole perception. That's so powerful. So <laughs> um, I'm so grateful. I, I, um, I want to ask one more question before I open it up to other people who are still here to ask questions. Uh, so by the way, because there's always a lag between me asking and me seeing your responses, uh, folks who are watching, if you have a question, this is a good time to start thinking about gearing up your questions. Um, so my last question for you would be, if somebody is on the fence, if somebody's thinking about doing Body Love Lab, but they're not sure if they should do it, what would you tell them? I'm going to tell them what I learned from you and from the people that were a part of this group. And that is kind of coming back to the self-care thing. If you're on the fence about something, but you've given it thought, if that thought has crossed your mind, you're still thinking about dipping a toe, right? Right. You're debating. You're like, mm, that pool looks pretty good. I don't know. Maybe the cost has you scared. Like maybe we feel inherently bad as humans, a lot of us, about spending money on ourselves. It's easy to spend money on other people. And like, I'm bad about that too. We've had this conversation, you and I. I like this is not a new dialogue. Um, just do it. Ignition is like the hardest thing in the world. Like lighting the fire, lighting a healthy little fire under your butt and making yourself go do something is the hardest thing in the world. Like 
sometimes you just have to pull the trigger and you need to invest the time in yourself. Like that has become since this program, since I took body love lab, that has become kind of the big driving force in my life. And it made, it, it did initiate a bunch of pretty big changes for me. Some of which were scary. Um, like in the last year I've ended my dance troupe. I've signed up for a bunch of intensives to travel all over the place. And I bought a house, like, <laughs> like huge life changing stuff. Right. But like, I never would have, I don't think I would have been brave enough to do all those things had I not taken the step and joined this program and done the work and gotten more comfortable with me and realizing that like Shannon's not good enough to Shannon sometimes. And Shannon needs to be a lot nicer to Shannon and invest more time in her and think of herself in a different way. And that was really why I did it. And I urge everybody, and I've had that conversation and I've had people sign up for the program who have reached out to me and they're like, I'm on the fence. I'm like, don't be on the damn fence. Just jump, just yeah. jump, precipice it. Trust me, you're not going to fall and hurt yourself. They're going to catch you. It's going to be delightful. You're going to be like, oh my God, what was I worried about in the first place? I love it. So, Thank you. so uh, Cindy, I know you're still here. Is anyone, does anyone have questions uh, for me or for Shannon? Go ahead and ask your questions. And while I'm waiting to see your questions pop up, um, I will say, I, I said, if you watch to the end, there's a treat. So the, the thing that I want to offer you is if you have watched all the way to the end, um, obviously that means that you're interested in doing this perhaps. So I would love to set aside some time to talk with you one-on-one -on -one about what's going on for you and if Body Love Lab is right for you. And I'd also love to offer you $50 off of the program if you decide to sign up. Um, so there's a special registration link for you if you have made that decision. Um, so, questions. Does anyone have any questions? What is the Body Love Lab and what is the cost? All right. Hi, Leona. So, the Body Love Lab is a group coaching program. It's an eight-week program now. Uh, it started at six weeks, but we just that was, just wasn't enough time. It's a two-month program. It starts on April 14th. Um, the website for it is www.thebodylovelab.com all one word. And um, I can also set up a time to talk with you. Oh, where is it? It's all online. So all of this work is done online. It's all pretty much at your own pace. Um, we meet weekly via Zoom now. Um, so we do group video chats. Um, I do talk with everyone about at the beginning, we try to narrow down the best time for everyone to meet. And then the, the calls are recorded. So if you miss a call, it goes back up, you can watch it but it's all done online. So every week you're given a packet of reading and exercises to do at home. There's a private Facebook group for it. So you're 24 seven connected to me, to the other people in the group. You're given a buddy. Um, so you're digging into this work. We're all talking all the time. And then weekly we come together and we have group coaching calls um, and you're completely supported through this process of healing um, we dig into a lot of deep stuff, but it's really starting with self-acceptance, with how we care for our physical selves, with learning how to feel our feelings and reconnect to our intuition, with overhauling our inner dialogue and how we talk to ourselves, with um, changing our relationship to personal pleasure, spending money on ourselves, giving ourselves things we like, making sure that we are filling our lives with things we enjoy, uh, with setting boundaries and maintaining and creating healthy boundaries with people in our lives. Uh, and then with how we advocate for bodies. Evelyn is here, Evelyn's done Body Love Lab. So, um, so it is all online, it can be done from anywhere. The other thing that's different this time in terms of cost is that there are now three tiers to the Body Love Lab program. I added on two additional tiers for people who want to work with me more one-on-one. -on -one. So there's an elevated program where every other week you can do a one-on-one -on -one session with me. And then there's, I forget what I named them. They're like, I don't know. It's like something else. <laughs> but there's one where you can do weekly group. Uh, you can do weekly one-on-one -on -one with me in addition to the group. So that's like, if you're really working through some super deep trauma stuff and you want to do more tapping, um, personal work, meditation, readings, um, more one-on-one -on -one dialogue about your personal issues. Um, so the prices are different depending on if you're doing the original group program or if you want more one-on-one -on -one contact. 
there are payment plans for all of it and that's all available online. So if you want to set up a time to talk, I'll message you after this and we can talk about um, what's going on for you. And if that's something that you feel like you need, I would love to support you in your process. Does anyone else have questions for me or for Shannon? I know. I'm like, my, one of my cats is running around like a total spaz. And I keep, so if I keep like looking off camera, I'm like, please don't break stuff. Please. <laughs> hi, Samantha. Hi, Evelyn. Hi, Cindy. Hi, Fiona. Hi, everyone who's here. All right. So going once, going twice for questions. And Shannon, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time. I also just want to thank you for being such a consistent presence in, in my work. It's, it's really magical to me to have somebody show up and be like, oh, this work is bomb and to keep working with you because I've seen so much. I get to be a witness to your growth and transformation from where we started in Rocket Launcher to then yeah. Body Love. Now in Master Moon, I've been working with you, like you said, for a couple of years now. And it's so cool. I mean, I know you know the same thing in dance. Like when you have a student who drops in once in a while, it's cool. But when you have a student who stays with you long enough for you to see them improve, it's like a completely different yes. thing. <laughs> it was really cool for me as a coach now to start to have people in my work life who I've been able to watch for an extended period of time. Uh, Cindy, so my background in psychology. Um <laughs> By background in psychology, if you mean I spent my fucking life being sent to therapists. Um, <laughs> Girl, same. <laughs> <laughs> and then that book, that's my background in psychology. Um, so my, I do not have a, a formal background in psychology, no. I, um, my training is in coaching. I have been in a lot of therapy. I have had a lot of coaching. Um, I've also done a lot of 12 step work, a lot of reading, a lot of um, healing modalities uh, from other forms. Um, I would say this work is really the synthesis of um, all of the healing that I went through. So I, and I talk about this more both in the, the book and in the lab itself, but um, I had a lot of stuff in my upbringing, uh, that was really challenging, uh, with my parents, with my body, eating disorders, cutting, depression, um, orthorexia, which is, uh, exercise addiction. I grew up dancing and I've always had a body that was not, uh, ideal in the dance space. Um, really intense bullying, uh, I left home at a really young age, molestation, sexual assault. Like I did not think I was going to live through my twenties, um, which I'm really comfortable talking about. Um, yeah. And I, I deeply believe that words don't teach right experience teaches. So my experience was that I thought I was going to die and I was actually really okay with that. And at a certain point I realized that I wasn't right. I remember being 27 and being like, oh, I'm 27, so I'm not going to die by 25. I should probably stop fucking off my credit. Um, <laughs> right. uh, humor is also a big way that I deal with myself. So, um, so my, what I feel to be my journey toward body love started when I was, uh, I, I think it's been about 12 years of, of my, like, hey, if I'm not going to die, I need to figure out how to live. Um, and I don't want to be sad all the time. And I've been diagnosed with depression. I've been on medication. I've been diagnosed with anxiety. I've had panic attacks. I literally don't have them anymore. And I, I cannot say, because I'm not a doctor, I can't say I can heal a disease, right? Um, what I can say is that the work that I've done, the healing that I've done, the different things that I've experienced have led me to have a different feeling about a lot of the things that our medical and psychology industries, I think, get wrong because we try to solve all problems through the brain. And it's a very white supremacist, cis hetero, masculine way of looking at the world. <laughs> um, 
there are modalities from other places. There's a feminine way of working. There is a different world available in working through the body, in honoring the wisdom of the body. Um, trauma is something that is contained in the body. Um, when we start addressing our feelings through our feelings. So one of the things that I say a lot in the work is that you cannot think your way out of your feelings. You can only feel your way out of your feelings, which is why we started talking at the beginning about that difference between intellectually understanding why something's wrong, but still feeling that way right? You can, that was my issue with talk therapy. I'm a really fucking smart, really fucking verbal person, right? So I can tell you the story of why I was fucked up. I, I, I knew that story inside and out. I could sit with a therapist and run them down all of the reasons why I was the way I was, but I wasn't changing, right? So when we get into starting to move the trauma through our bodies, right? And all trauma really is, is um, it is anything that we didn't have the emotional resources to process as it was happening. Your body is just like, cool, I'll hold that for you, right? Until you do, right? Which is why stuff that happened when you're a kid is still in your body. You're still carrying it around. You can still be triggered by something that touches on that same thing because all that trauma, it's like undigested food. You're just walking around carrying this stuff, waiting for you to have the emotional tools and resources to go back through and process it properly, to process it through. So learning how to like emotionally digest these things that we're carrying, these are all things that happen in our body. And then when we start to understand neuroplasticity, the fact that we are intellectually, it, we don't really fully understand our brain. I, I could talk about this all day. Oh my God, you guys got me on a roll and I'm on day quill. Like I'm not, I'm not right for this y'all, but no, I don't have a background in psychology. I have a background in a lot of different things. In my 12 years of working on myself, at a certain point, a couple of years ago, people started telling me all the time, I wish I felt about myself the way you feel about yourself. I wish I loved my body as much as you do. I wish I was as confident as you are. I wish that I had the strength that you have. And I was like, oh, y'all think I woke up like this. No, 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 no. I've been working on this for so long that now people who meet me think I was always that way. And I was already a teacher and I was already a writer and I was already a coach. So my question was, can this be taught? Is this a process I can th synthesize that I can make into a package that I can say of the 12 years of healing I've done, this is really what got me here. Um, and so I put out a call and I said, Hey, if I were to offer a course on this, would people sign up? And a bunch of people said, fuck yes. And so I, I started writing and this is what happened. Um, and now I've done the program with, over a hundred people. And I have seen just like Shannon reported miracles. I have seen miraculous healing take place. Um, I'm constantly honing and refining. I'm constantly learning. I have a coach. I work with people. I'm, you know, I'm training all the time myself. So um, as the lab evolves, as I evolve, as the lab evolves, we're evolving together. I am bringing in new information, new resources, new tools. Um, as we are growing together. Um, but no, I'm not a psychologist. I cannot diagnose or treat any <laughs> disease. But what I can tell you is like, I literally healed my own anxiety in the first round of Body Love Lab. I haven't had a panic attack. I used to have panic attacks every single month. And I had low grade anxiety, like not anxiety attacks to the point where like I thought I needed to go to the hospital, but um, I had nightly physical anxiety uh, from the time I was about 13 years old until the first round of body love lab and the work that we started doing, uh, with tapping. And, uh, I haven't had anxiety in two years, none, not a single bit. Um, and that's not unusual. Like the things that people report to me of the healing work they've been able to do through the work we do in the lab by addressing these things in our bodies, it fucking changes shit. Okay. I talked forever. Let me rolling back up. Um, <laughs> I'm so glad you're having this. Of course, today is day one of potty training. So I'm in and out. Christy, awesome. Thank you. Uh, enjoy potty training. That sounds really fun and scary. <laughs> and crazy. So uh, I will definitely follow up with you. Hi, Kim. I love you. Cindy, same here. Yes, experience teaches. 
Evelyn, Body Love Lab, and working with therapists, and they both help in different ways. Yeah, agreed. I was wondering about that. I, I totally recommend doing all the things, right? So yes, have a therapist, do Body Love Lab, get massages, <laughs> like, see yes, all the, like, yes, get, yes, yes. Get, yeah, uh, get wolfing, <laughs> get Reiki, like, fucking all the shit. Do all the, go to 12 step. I am constantly, I, I do not believe there's a panacea. I like all growth tools. I know that there's like um there's a cocktail of personal growth tools that work for people. Uh, and to me, this journey is nothing if not personal. So finding the tools and resources that work for you is the thing. Uh, it definitely like, like also made me like, even for me, it made me aware of like putting that extra time into myself. Like I take the time to get monthly massage therapy appointments now. Cause it's like, I never did that before. Cause I felt guilty and I'm like, uh, uh-uh, no girl, I am worth it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Samantha, yeah. I read Samantha's comment. I can relate to that. I have a degree in psychology and I still don't know how to sit with my urge to self-sabotage long enough to overcome it. Honey, get in the lab. Let's work. Yeah. Let's do it. Sarah's coaching is what actually made me comfortable with the idea of talking to others that helped me be more open to therapy. Oh, yay. Uh, mm. Who works with how emotions feel in the body. Therapy is like any other healthcare provider. It takes, thank you so much, Evelyn. I totally agree with that. I have, um, I've definitely had therapists who were not the right fit. Um, and though I, it's always hard when you are working with any medical professional who is not the right fit because it's another place where you can feel like it's your fault or that like you're doing it wrong because they're the expert. And so having the strength to advocate for yourself and to not assume that it's because of you and to be just like, oh no, you're just not the right match for me. Is, is a really important thing. And sometimes we're not even at the the level of self-advocacy to be able to find the right healthcare provider until we do some internal work. Oh my gosh, I love you guys so much. This is fucking rad. Um, apparently also Saturday at noon is the time because none of the other lives we've done have had this much uh, interaction. So I'm so excited about Yay. your comments. <laughs> yes. And Shannon's also magical. So I think that that adds to it. Is Aww. there um, anything else? that anybody wants to ask or share before we sign off. I want to be mindful of Shannon's time. She has a big day today. It's a big weekend in the world of professional wrestling. Stupid thing going on. And I I host a podcast. I know. It's such a weird (laughs) freaking thing. It's fun though. It's so cool. We'll plug your podcast real quick. If anyone else has a question, they can ask it. Oh, hell yeah. Sure, sure, sure. I actually have a second one starting, too. Um, so the first one is the Married Marks podcast. It is a professional wrestling podcast, but before you eye roll, first off, yes, we know it's fake. Second, um, it's female-led. So, <laughs> like, tell me something I don't know, folks. Um, it is female-led, and we try to take a very progressive stance on the industry. So we talk about lack of equity. We talk about lack of... Um, equitable bookings for women and members of the LGBT plus community and differently um, people that are disabled uh, we, we ch- and people of color. So we try to talk about like the good, but we also talk a lot about the bad and the lack of equitable opportunities in professional wrestling. So we have a lot of people that listen to our podcast that don't know a whole lot about wrestling. I'm just really interested in hearing about uh the uh the rah rah hey i'm really mad at all the angry fanboys talk and i do rant at length on that podcast um and then i have one starting in june called the inventive movement podcast uh that's going to be kind of a similar focus but in the realm of movement uh so literally kind of the same concept but it's all going to be movement based so people that work in burlesque and belly dance and pole and aerial arts and uh, hip hop, twerk, whatever, like just I want to I want to talk to people and get people's different perspectives and opinions about uh, equitable booking. What's it like to work as a producer? What's it like to work as a performer? What are your perspectives? How can we share information and make the movement community better? instead of feeding into the consistent problems like how do we how do we address it and and get better is basically the whole focus and that's going to launch probably at the end of june i love it 
Well, mm. thank you so much. I don't see any other questions coming up. So we're going to sign off, but this will be saved and shared and replayed. And I'm going to cross post it to my YouTube. So thank you so much, Shannon, for your time. Thank you so much, everybody who watched. And if you express interest in the group, I will follow up with you after this. Um, and again, because you watched to the end, you are uh, automatically uh, eligible to get $50 off the program if you decide to, decide to sign up. So have a great Saturday, everybody. And thank you so much, Shannon. And I'll talk to you all soon. Thanks, Sarah. Bye. Bye.